please check out the Night Dreams Talk Radio website at www.nightdreamstalkradio.com. Also, if you want to keep our show free of advertising, just hit the donate button. Give a buck or two. Remember, all prior shows are always free to listen to. We at Night Dreams Talk Radio thank you for your support. Well, night dreamers out there, this is your Saturday night host, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer coming at you like a cosmic tumbleweed, hopefully, uh, coming your way with some real interesting uh, guests and topics to talk about. Matter of fact, tonight, I am so excited to have my old friend and uh, famed ufologist, I call him, Peter Davenport on the line from the National UFO Reporting Center. Uh, Peter, can you hear me right now? I can hear you live, and uh, thanks for having me on, Michael. It uh, evokes fond memories of some of the adventures we've had together to be appearing to you, together with you on the UFO program. So oh, I'm what? delighted to be here tonight and looking forward to sharing a lot of interesting information with our listeners. Well, this is going to be a great show. Matter of fact, um, uh, we happen to have the whole hour with Peter Davenport tonight. This is a real treat for us because typically we'll have a sighting up update periodically. But uh, I thought it would be really wonderful to spend a little bit more time tonight with Peter. And uh, I I asked Gary Tombstone Anderson, our uh, uh, station host and the uh, you know weekday uh, host of Night Dreams Talk Radio, to be able to come on the show because uh, Gary and uh, Peter have some great stories to share as well. So I don't know if you can uh, jump on there, Gary, but uh, jump in there if you can. Well, hi, Michael. Hi, Peter. How's your evenings going? Hi, Gary. Oh, we're... Nice to be appearing together with you. Well, it's nice to uh, have you on Night Dreams. And um, you know what I thought, uh, Gary, would be... uh, You know, Peter uh, doesn't get a chance very often to um, sit back and just listen uh, to various uh, paranormal uh, UFO hosts uh, like yourself uh, to talk a little bit about your your background. And I know that your listeners out there, uh, hundreds of thousands strong, would love to be able to have a little background about uh, you and Art Bell. I thought that would be interesting. Well, what would you like to know about Art Bell and my... I, I've known Art uh, off and on, gee. You know, at the start, we had kind of a love-hate uh, relationship. Uh, i known him since probably about uh, 1990 and uh, originally met him, you know, sending him, well, uh, well, emails or, you know, actually even before that, on a bulletin board he ran. I would, you know, post things up in the bulletin board and he'd respond and then eventually got into where we were, you know, talking each other, you know, several times a year. And then, you know, we talk sometimes, you know, like once a month, sometimes like every three or four months. Uh, Really nice guy. You know, he told me how he got into, you know, uh, UFOs and the paranormal uh, when uh, uh, John Lear came to his studio when he was in Las Vegas and after he finished his uh, show, you know, he was a little bit, I guess, depressed because Art told me he really didn't like doing a political show. It just didn't rub well with him. And yeah. the audience wasn't quite what he was hoping it would be. And uh, John Lear said, well, you know, Art, you need to get into the paranormal. You need to get into UFOs you know, aliens and things like that. And, you know, Art told me, he said he thought about it for like 15 seconds. And uh, the next day, that's what he got on the air. And it changed from being a political talk show, you know, like the daily, you know, news type of talk show to yeah. the paranormal and UFOs and stuff like that. Well, I, th- I think uh, that was probably, uh, Peter, you'll probably agree with me, the the beginning of late night uh, paranormal radio right there when, when Art Bell did that uh, switch. That's, uh, that's a fascinating story. Uh, Peter, uh, when was the first time you ran across Art Bell? I was just thinking that. We must be on the same frequency tonight, Michael. <laughs> uh, the first time I ever appeared on Coast to Coast was in, I believe it was early October 1994. 
uh, just a few months after I had taken over the hotline, and I heard Stan Friedman being interviewed, and I had met Stan on a couple of occasions, so I I called the caller number, and by golly, I got through, and my question to Stan, or more like a comment, was that obviously the Air Force is interested in UFOs because they have a course in UFOs at the Air Force Academy. Uh, I'm told that what they do is bring their students in, and somebody who has a security clearance brings in the material for them, hands it out, and then collects it at the end of the class. Well, after that appearance, I called Art again and said, you know, I'm running the National UFO Reporting Center, and I'm getting some interesting information. I wonder if you would have me on as a guest. And he said, name a date. (laughs) (laughs) And he was very cordial and uh, experimental. He, He would go in any direction that seemed reasonable to him. And that is the reason that he built a program into a radio monument, I think. He was, he was very creative and very permissive and uh, hang loose. So I really appreciated his style. Well, both of you guys uh, seems to have hooked up with Art at about the same time, not knowing it. That's interesting. Yeah. You were in 1990, you said, Gary? Yeah, right about 1990, yes. Yeah, that was four years or so before I got hooked up with him. And I'm glad I did because uh, on the night of the Phoenix Lights, Thursday, March 13th, 1997, I just picked up the telephone, which I had the immense privilege to do, and called him. And I said, Art, something big has happened in in, uh, the Phoenix area tonight. And he said, I'm getting calls too, Peter. And he said... We'll start with you in the first hour. And that was, I would argue that he and his program broke, was the first to break news about the immensely dramatic UFO sighting over Phoenix that night. Even the New York Times hasn't done anything to cover that uh, that incident. Yeah. And, uh, we had a really knockdown, drag out program for the first hour, and I think it probably stimulated a lot of people in uh, Arizona who had seen the objects that night who otherwise would not have submitted a report to do so. So that's one of the nice things about a program like that is you get feedback from the listeners. Well, you know something, oh. t- t- too, you know, I was going to say, at the beginning, you know, Art told me he really didn't believe in ufos and it was not to him uh to him and his wife uh you know uh saw a ufo uh, you know the triangle uh black ufo it was quiet it just kind of floated by that had him totally a hundred percent convinced that they did exist wow isn't that interesting he- Go he ahead. called me shortly after that incident, uh, Gary, and he described it, and I did everything in my power to get him to submit a written report, and I've forgotten whether we actually got one from him. But I remember the incident clearly. I think it was before the Phoenix Lights. Yeah, it probably could. It was him and Ramona, uh, uh, you know, his wife at the time, that uh, sadly passed on. But, uh, you know, that kind of really shook him up. And, you know, I will yeah. say, like, again, when he first started in, you know, he didn't really believe in UFOs. He told me that when he started the show, he looked at it as entertainment. And, you know, he always stressed when he approached me on a phone conversation about 15 months ago, you know, he knew I was retired. He knew I was crazy, uh, still riding a motorcycle with my health issues and, uh, you know, my age. And that's when he told me, hey, you know, you need to get back on radio. And I said, I don't think I can handle commercial radio anymore. It's kind of like pass me by. And he goes, no, Internet radio. And, uh, you know, with his help, that's what I've been doing. And, you know, everything he predicted about my show and Internet radio in general has really happened. But I will say this, uh, Peter and Michael, if it wasn't for... Uh, John Lear coming into that office at that radio station in Las Vegas and, you know, spending about an hour with Art, convincing Art, 
hey, you need to get into the paranormal, mainly UFOs, because that's what John Lear's in, the UFOs, always has been. Uh, I don't think you would be seeing what we hear, or I, I, I should say back up, well, you wouldn't be seeing on TV or hearing on the radio what we have heard all these years, because I don't think uh, the UFO topic would have been even half what it is now, or even ghost hunting, anything. The paranormal started, as far as I'm concerned, really big time when Art came, uh, you know, on the air with it. Yep. We, the UFO community owes an immense debt of gratitude to Art and his program and subsequent host, George Nori now, of course, because they have popularized information and this program as well, Night Dreams Talk Radio. They do a wonderful job of allowing people like me who are in the front lines of getting UFO data to get that data out to the American people as quickly as possible. So it's an immense service to a field which is addressing the most important scientific question that has ever confronted mankind, namely, are we alone in this galaxy or are we not? And clearly... From my vantage point, the answer to that question is we are not alone, and the story is not being treated adequately by the press and by the government. No. They they, they are still, uh, you know, uh, trying to debug it uh, uh, to, you know, make it like it's not real. And, and the funny thing is, you know, even Michael, when I got him on the show last night, we kind of changed the topic of my show last night because I wanted to the uh, guest, you know, uh, to hear from Michael, the experience he had at Mount Adams. And, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, that is the most strangest thing I have ever heard. You know, I tried debunking that, you know, Michael, really hard. Uh, the only thing I could debunk out of your whole uh, <laughs> experience was the battery issue in the car. That's about all I could debunk. But everything yeah. else, it really, and especially when you got that compass out. And uh, you did that little test on your uh, wrist, and it started, you know, responding. I, I still think you need to go in and get x-rays. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, uh equilateral uh, puncture mark wound on my left wrist that uh, seems to be, uh, even today, a little uh, uh, magnetic. Or at least it, uh, it causes the compass uh, to go off course and come right to it. That's kind of interesting. And it was your idea to come up with that test during the show last night, Gary. Um, so I thank you for that. Cause I hadn't even thought of the idea that, uh, something like a mark on your skin could be magnetic. So, um, anyway, Hey, I thought it would be great for you, Gary, since you don't get a chance very often to, uh, ask Peter from the national UFO reporting center, uh, a general question. What would you like to know about new fork? Uh, and Peter, that uh, you've always been dying to ask him. Well, I what I really want to ask him is about his first experience with a, a UFO. I mean, what his feeling was when he first, you know, saw that. Yeah, well, I'd be delighted to talk about it, but in doing so, I recognize that I'm committing the cardinal sin that I accuse other people of, and that is talking about their experience rather than writing about the experience. But I will, uh, I, since I've written my report down, in fact, I've had five or possibly six sightings in my life. After my first one in the summer of, I believe it was 1954, I was only six years of age at the time, I was sitting in the right-hand seat of a 1953 Studebaker. And those <laughs> on this program may just barely be old enough to remember what those looked like with the chrome ring on the nose. <laughs> but my father worked at Lambert Field, uh, St. Louis International Airport, back uh, starting in 1944. He was, a, uh, he was station manager for a major American airline. And uh, one night he had to work, and I believe it was the summer of 54, and I'll explain 